Welcome to a new bonus episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I'm a found footage fool. Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. All right, well, this is the second time that we've done this, uh, and certainly not the last, because as I've said in previous podcasts... I have a problem. I like found footage movies, or if not like them, I'm I'm drawn to them. I think when they work, they're really effective, and when they don't work, they're nigh unwatchable. And so for this second episode of Found Footage Fool, we are looking at the film Curse of Aurora, uh, a found footage film that came out in 2020 uh, that is the tale of of a group of filmmakers, unsurprisingly, who are going in search of uh, something spooky. In this case, though, there's a little bit of a twist in that they're basically hooking up to try to figure out the next movie they want to make, and they know they want to base it sort of loosely around uh, the this poor girl who was killed named Aurore. And uh, it's it's all shot in Quebec, so that's why everything... Uh, sounds all French-like. And so they manage to uh, capture some legitimate uh, haunted phenomena. And also there seems to be some weird people surrounding uh, the town or, or living in the town. And they are keeping an eye on our trio of filmmakers. And so with Found Footage Fool, uh, we like to apply a little bit of science to this. We don't want to just make stuff up. Uh, the way that sometimes happens in found footage movies. And so we are applying five criteria. The first of the criteria is, does it make sense in this movie to keep the camera on? And for Curse of Aurora, uh, yeah, it does, because they are filmmakers. Um, The movie also is pretty good about having them set the camera down sometimes. And so you just see sort of the the camera in a fixed position while other people are running around so it's not maybe perfect in this arena but pretty good it's not just a bunch of random knuckleheads uh trying to to capture the best uh footage that they can it is in fact uh filmmakers who are sort of documenting the creative process as well just filming each other goofing off and whatnot and you know eh, like i said not a hundred percent but i it makes sense for the most part Then we come to criteria number two. Are the characters any good? Do you want them to die immediately? Or do you actually care about these people? And I'll say that these characters are not not terrible. You've got three central characters. There is Kevin, who is is sort of the on-screen personality. Uh, Then you have Aaron, who is sort of the director and usually the the cameraman. And then uh, the writer, Lena. And, you know, all three of them are fairly likable. Uh, Kevin is a little bit more of a jerk, as played by Jordan Kaplan, but he's sort of recognized to be a jerk uh, by the others, by Lena and Aaron. Um, You know, they're not terrific characters, but they're serviceable, is probably how I would put it. They're not so irritating that you're actively rooting for them to die. And there's a little bit of a story that Aaron might have this long-standing crush on Lena and is just a little too shy to uh, go about saying anything about it. And, you know, that always makes someone a little more likable if they're a bit of an underdog and uh, trying to win the heart of the Lady Fair. And so I'm mostly okay with the characters as they stand. Not great, but not just awful. They're not the worst people you ever met. Uh, Then what about authenticity, the veracity of the film itself? And here's where I think Curse of Aurora is lacking somewhat in that a lot of times these performances feel like performances. The one say I will, uh, we'll, we'll get into watchability in a second, but I will say that even though they feel very actorly at times in the course of this film, the movie doesn't drop into having these characters just improv for a while, which might feel a little more authentic but it's also, generally speaking, a lot more annoying, too. Um, so the authenticity factor, also some of those surrounding uh, characters, some of the townies, the performances there, again, are very dramatic performances. They're not 
the the kind of performances that sometimes you get in found footage. And so I would say on an authenticity level, it fails in that regard. But one thing that it does do is it actually uses this Curse of Aurora as its basis. And it turns out that's actually kind of a semi-true story. And also it is bookended by um, a, a web host named Casey Nolan, who does... Uh, a series on YouTube, I believe, called Mindseed TV. I looked it up enough to understand that he was, in fact, a guy who does some dark web kind of research. And the whole premise of this, uh, the the setup is, we got this thumb drive with this footage on it uh, via the dark web. And so on that level, there's a hint of authenticity there. But for the bulk of the film, when you're watching these actors... Uh, talk to one another and kind of bounce off the locals and that kind of thing. And it feels very much like you're watching a movie. Um, then we get to watchability, which is somewhat tied to authenticity, but watchability is more about, is the movie entertaining? And for the most part, yeah, I think it is. Curse of Aurora is, uh, it, it doesn't totally explain itself, which I also kind of like. That it's not 100% spelled out for you as a viewer as to what exactly is going on here. You kind of understand that uh, Kevin is probably the guy who is responsible for everything going wrong because he steals some shit that he shouldn't have stolen. But that aside, yeah, it, it's a fairly entertaining movie. Um, there are especially a, a lot of nice touches with having some things happening in the background that the characters don't initially notice. In fact, one of my biggest complaints with the movie is that the characters sort of have this moment where they realize all the stuff that they didn't see that we, the audience, saw, they're now catching up to it. They, they watch some of the footage that we saw them filming, and when we saw, like, oh, there's a little girl standing in that doorway, and oh, there's a girl's face uh, in the tombstone and so forth... That stuff was, I think, more fun when the characters didn't know it, and we did. But in fairness, that all happens in the last half hour. So uh, for the most part, it's kind of fun to play that game where you're like, oh, is there something happening uh, behind them in the in the background of this scene? And that's not always the case. And it doesn't do the paranormal activity thing of like you've got the oscillating fan and two times it uh, it turns to the right and nothing's there. And then the third time it is when something shows up in the background, it tends to kind of linger there or at least come in and out of you. And I like that there. That was kind of fun. So by the end of it, I kind of reached a point where I wasn't entirely sure that everything was cleanly explained. And so it felt a little confusing as to what was going on. But again, by this point, you're talking about the last, I don't know, 15 minutes of the movie. And by then I was fairly into the goings on, even if I didn't a hundred percent understand it. Uh, so, you know, for a movie that comes in at 87 minutes of runtime, uh, yeah, for the most part, I do think that this is a pretty watchable found footage movie. I think, uh, it, it skews on the side of more entertaining than authentic. And then finally, our last criteria on found footage full is perhaps the most important. Uh, are there any scares in this movie? And yeah, less so jump scares, although there are a couple of those, and I, those I find less interesting. But it's got a nice, creepy atmosphere. The house that they're in is is kind of eerie, even though it doesn't totally pay off every second of that. Uh, there, there are some opportunities, I think, to use that house uh, in a little bit more frightening way, but it's fine. But yeah, the stuff that's happening in the background is pretty creepy. And the fact that it it just sort of hangs out without the characters knowing it's going on and you as the audience, you know, it's the old Alfred Hitchcock thing of you put a bomb under the table and the audience knows, but the characters don't. And that felt like what was happening on the front end of this movie, which I think is actually the better half of the film. The front half, I think, is better than the back half. But that's when you get to have all the fun of like, oh my goodness, there's a little girl standing in that doorway and they don't see her. And oh my goodness, did you see that cross turn upside down? That stuff was really fun. And at the end of the day, on a scale of uh, one to five stars, 
I would come in at about three stars for Curse of Aurora. If you are a found footage fan, as am I, or a found footage fool uh, like I am, then this is one of the better ones I've seen recently. Um, like I said, it doesn't have the whiff of authenticity that some of them do, but also it trades that for being a little more narrative and a little more plot driven. And I can appreciate that. And I had a good time for my 90 minutes with this movie. So I would kind of recommend this one. Unlike Behind the Sightings, which I thought was a real waste of time for everybody involved. I think Curse of Aurora is uh, is pretty fun and has some, some genuinely uh, creepy stuff in it. So uh, that is it for this time on Found Footage Full. We like to keep these short, uh, shorter than the movies themselves, which tend to be fairly brief in their runtime as well. Uh, so anyway, I hope you're enjoying this stuff. Uh, like I said, just a little bite size episode. Uh, and if you're a found footage knucklehead like myself, then here's one. Uh, this one was available on Amazon prime as well. So if you have Amazon prime, totally free and it's a great one to, uh, to kind of throw on while you're carving up the pumpkins this, uh, Halloween weekend. All right, folks, we've got more stuff coming in the week ahead. Night of the demons. Uh, that series is beginning with Mark Ball, so we have that to look forward to, and a bunch of other stuff coming in November. So thanks, as always, for listening to The Dark Parade, and we will see you soon.